Okay, so now we're going to talk about um, how ocean currents are going to affect climate. So um, what is going to actually create these ocean currents is going to be those winds that we were talking about. And so when you have wind going over the water, it's going to create that current. And then obviously if it hits a landmass, then it's going to move, right? So um, gyres are going to be these big currents that are kind of constant currents that are going to be going around. And so they're going to also go through that Coriolis effect that we talked about because of the rotation of the Earth. Um, but what's important about these is they actually are going to carry heat with them. Now I have a great picture here to show you what I am talking about. Um, so this is going to be those wind patterns and then here are going to be the water currents. So a um, couple of ones that I want you to notice is um, the Gulf Stream which starts in the Gulf and goes all the way up here. Um, this is going to carry heat with it. So this is why it actually is going to help the East Coast have milder winters than it could, um, which is a scary thought if you think about it. But also, this is the reason why when I went to Ireland, there were palm trees there, because all of that heat gets carried up there. Now this is one of those currents that's getting affected by climate change, and so they're very worried because if that doesn't make it up to Europe, that could really cause Europe to get cold. Um, another current that we should be familiar with is going to be this California current here. Notice where that's coming from, from the north. Have you ever jumped in the water in California? Because I did, and the second my big toe hit the water, I was like, whoa, it was so cold. And that's because it's coming from the north down to the south. So that's carrying cold water with it. And if you think about it, there's always a little nip in the air, especially like San Francisco, that type of thing. And that's because of that California current. So you can see how these currents are all causing different things to happen. Now, just to show you the impact that a current can have, I want you to notice this current that's right here going off of the coast of South America. It's pulling water away from the coast, okay? Now, if I um, were to go back to my um, uh, doodler here, okay, so let me clear off my sweet mountain drawing and let's talk about um, this current. So, we're going to have our water and then here is the coast of South America, okay? So what's gonna happen is during normal times, the wind and water currents are going away from the coast of South America. If you're pulling water away from the coast, then it needs to be replaced. And so you're gonna have water from the depths come up and replace it. That's called upwelling. Upwelling is awesome because it's full of oxygen and nutrients. So the fish do awesome all around the coast of South America. But what happens, let me get rid of that, what happens during an El Nino year is going to be that this stops, and if that stops, then this stops. If all of those stop, what's going to happen is you're going to have mass fish die-offs. But it doesn't just end there. You actually are going to have other things happen. Um, this is going to be a map showing you what happens during an El Nino year. It's going to be drought all throughout here. You're going to have winter storms all throughout here. So in Colorado, when we have an El Nino year, we actually get a lot of snow. So just that little current right here slowing down causes all of this stuff to happen. So it's crazy how El Nino can cause that. And um, I don't know if you're familiar, but I just love this video because it's awesome. So here is a sweet video about El Nino that I think is funny. I am El Nino. All of the tropical storms must bow before El Nino. Yo soy El Nino. For those of you who don't habla espanol, El Nino is Spanish for the Nino. So there's your uh, big lesson there. You're welcome. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, during that El Nino year, that's going to be when you um, don't get that upwelling. As far as when it happens, it happens every two to seven years. Um, so they can kind of relatively predict when an El Nino year is going to happen. Um, okay, so the next thing is going to be marine ecosystems and their different zones that they're going to have. So the way that we're going to classify marine ecosystems is going to be their distance from shore and then how deep they are. And that's obviously going to be affecting the amount of light that's penetrating them. So I think it's easiest if we actually look at this PowerPoint of the different zones. 
Okay, so you're going to have your intertidal zone, and that's going to obviously be the distance between high tide and low tide. So that's going to have its own set of conditions. The organisms that live there are the awesome badasses of the ocean, and that's because they have to deal with being exposed and drying out to being covered up. They get exposed to sunlight. They get exposed to predators. So it's really tough to live in the intertidal zone. The other thing you want to think about is in those tide pools that form, and I think I've got a picture, yeah. So like these tide pools that form, they're going to get all that UV light hitting them, and that's going to heat up the water. So now they're dealing with temperature fluctuations. The other thing that's going to happen is the water is going to evaporate, and then the salt stays there, so now the salinity goes up. So these guys are really, really tough to be living in that environment. All right, the next zone is going to be the neuritic zone. And the neuritic zone is going to be along the shore, and that's going to be, um, you know, a couple hundred feet deep. And so that's where you're going to find the most of, like, the coral reefs and that type of stuff. Um, then you're going to have this pelagic zone out here, and that's going to be the open ocean, right? And so that's where you're going to find a lot of plankton floating and that type of thing. Now, anywhere in those zones I just mentioned where light can penetrate is called the photic zone. Anywhere that it cannot penetrate is called the aphotic zone, right? If you put A in front of something, it's not. Um, all along the bottom is going to be what's called the benthic zone. And so what's going to happen is the benthic zone is eventually, when you get really deep, going to turn into what's called the abyssal zone. And the abyssal zone is where absolutely no light can penetrate. And that's where you're going to have these um, hydrothermal vents underneath the ocean's um, surface um, or along the bottom. And that's going to be its own set of ecosystems. And I think I've got some pictures of it. Yeah. So um, on those hydrothermal vents, they have these crazy big tube worms that live there. They have um, bacteria that's doing chemosynthesis instead of photosynthesis. So they're still finding out a lot about this um, hydrothermal vent community area. Now, these zones that I'm showing you here are going to be the um, freshwater zones. And so freshwater zones are going to be very similar. You can see you have a photic zone and an aphotic zone, and you have the benthic zone. But um, there's names. The, the names are a little bit different for the, the other ones. So in the um, saltwater habitat, we have the neuritic zone that went along the coastline. And in a freshwater habitat, it's called the littoral zone. Okay, So that's where you'll find attached algae and those types of things growing. Then, in the open middle area of the lake that's still um, going to be in the photic zone is called the limnetic zone. So that would be like the pelagic zone in the ocean water. And then um, very deep, which is not in this picture here, but um, there's going to be something called the profundal zone, and that's where no light can penetrate, and that's where you find like worms and prokaryotes and that type of stuff. So if we go back to your notes, you can see we've gone through all of these different things. Um, and... Fresh water, we've gone through all those different things there. Now, one thing that can happen in fresh water uh, or salt water is going to be something called thermal stratification. So anytime you say stratification, that means layering. And so thermal stratification is going to be layering due to temperature changes or differences. And so what will happen is you have the warm water floating at the top, and that's called the epilimnion. And then you have the cooler water below it called the hypolimnion. And you've probably experienced that if you've ever jumped into a lake and all of a sudden you feel your toe hit that like cold layer of water, you've hit the hypolimnion. Now, um, that's normal, but what needs to happen is in the spring and the fall, there needs to be a turnover that happens. Um, and so I have a picture here showing what I'm talking about. So um, as you know, um, we're going to have that warmer water and then the colder water below it. And the area between them is called the thermocline. Okay. Now what's going to happen in the autumn is you're going to have the cold weather coming in and that's going to cool the surface water. Well, the cooler water is, the more dense it is. So that's going to actually sink to the bottom and then that warmer water from the bottom is going to come up and so you have that kind of turnover happen. Now, what's going to happen in the winter is you're going to have ice form, and ice is less dense, and so that's going to be sitting at the top. But as that ice melts, it's actually going to become um, more dense, and so it's actually going to sink in the spring, and it's going to cause that turnover to happen. So the turnover needs to happen in spring and fall because that's going to bring oxygen and nutrients that's going to cause that upwelling that we talked about to happen. Okay. 
Then the last thing I wanted to talk about is going to be differences between aquatic and terrestrial ecosystems. So we've talked about this from time to time, but let's just kind of put it all together. So obviously one big difference is that aquatic ecosystems are going to have over a hundred times more inhabitable space than terrestrial. So in terrestrial, you're going to run out of room. There's going to be crowding that's going to happen. But in aquatic systems, there's room everywhere, right? The next thing is going to be that aquatic systems have more stable temperatures, and that's because of the specific heat of water, right, and how water does that hydrogen bonding, and so it kind of sticks to its own stuff, and so it's hard to get the water molecules moving. Then um, number three is pretty obvious. In an aquatic system, you don't have a shortage of water, but what's going to be the first limiting things with primary production will be lights and nutrients. Um, the next thing is going to be the primary producers. If I ask you what the primary producers are in a terrestrial ecosystem, you're going to say plants. Those are big. If you think about primary production in um, the ocean, it's going to be phytoplankton and, and you know cyanobacteria and those types of little things. So in the ocean, they're microscopic primary producers. That one with a degree is shorthand for primary producers. Um, and then they're going to have high turnover rates because things are always eating them, right? Then the fifth thing is something that I've touched on with um, ecosystems and food chains and that, and that's going to be the um, ectotherms. So ectotherms are going to be cold-blooded organisms, and so they're going to make up the majority of those ecosystems, the aquatic ecosystems, and they're not going to waste a lot of energy staying warm, right? So... For a given amount of energy, they can have larger population size living off of that, right? Because a terrestrial ecosystem is going to waste a lot of that energy just staying warm. And so they're going to need more energy per um, organism that's living in there. Okay, so that's going to be the um, ecosystems. I hope you enjoyed that.